cost us a little bit of business. Next week, instead of meeting here, we're going to join the Madison Economics Club in uh, their room in Shoker, 105, at the same time that we usually meet. Uh, they're bringing in Alex... Norasta. Norasta, who is uh, Cato, the Cato Institute's, <laughs> one of the Cato Institute's immigration policy analysts. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Cato Institute, they're a free market think tank in D.C., probably the most um, well-funded voice for uh, libertarianism or non-interventionist foreign policy in D.C. Um, so uh, that's certainly an interesting institute for libertarians to check out. I think you guys would really like that. So we're going to join them next week instead of being here. So that, I think, means our next discussion meeting won't be until after the break, where we can all uh, bitch and moan about last night a little bit. Um, should you find out if I should bring pizza there or not? Oh, um, do, you want, do you want us to bring pizza? Um, I don't think so, because there's gonna, we're hoping to have like a big attendance and like, so. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's a good, yeah. That's Hopefully. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, so, oh, and also thank you to all of you who were able to come out last Thursday to the debate in Wilson Hall, that went really well. And uh, congrats to you guys on doing a very good job representing uh, Madison Independence. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for all that. Uh, tonight we have a very special guest, JMU's own, Dr. Robert Subrick of the Economics Department to talk to us about Austrian economics. So take it away. All right, thanks. Um, I'm actually, this is just now public information, I'm the co-director of the Gillum Center for Free Enterprise and Business mm -hmm. Ethics now. Um, does anyone know about the Gillum Center? I guess no, because why would you? Um, it's a, Leslie Gillum graduated from JMU, um, I don't know, a long time ago, in the 80s, and she's in down the center there where we're going to be increasingly bringing in uh, free market type thinkers or speakers over the, you know, two or three per semester probably, starting in spring. So, for example, we've already lined up, I think it's for the end of March, Bob Lawson is coming here for a few days to give some talks. If he is the main person behind the Economic Freedom Index. He's the one who collects the data every year. So Bob's coming out, I think it's March 22nd, somewhere around there, and I'll share the information as we sort of finalize everything. So this is a new endeavor over in the business school that I just got part of. Now, I have no idea how much you know about Austrian economics, so when you hear the term, what do you think of? Yeah. Can you just where we go to the Gillen Center talk? What building is it? Uh, it'll be in Shoker, yeah. Shoker. Uh, like I was joking earlier, I rarely leave the building, so I had no idea how to get over here. Uh, <laughs> I know where Carrier is. I went to Warren once, and last week was my first attempt to visit Godwin. Um, and that's in six years. Wow. Uh, um, well, we get to park across the street, so I have very little reason to sort of maneuver too far. So I don't know what you guys know about it. Uh, I assume you've seen the, the uh, what are they called, the rap videos that Russ Roberts had put together, the two Hayek Keynes debates. Debate, uh, kind of debate things that really wasn't much of a debate if you read what really yeah. happened. Um, but they, they were friends and they argued about stuff. So I figured tonight what I'll do is give you a brief, you know, maybe 10 minutes at most, name the major players here, why they're important. Hayek is probably the most well known, along with Murray Rothbard. And then you have the Ludwig von Mises and the von Mises Institute down in Auburn is really another big player. And the discussion of what Austrian economics really means. And then I'll just go through some propositions, and feel free if you want me to talk more or less about things, just interrupt me. Uh, I prefer to talk le less is better kind of thing. I mean, just have to <coughs> so it all begins in 1871 or so. Karl Menger, a uh, professor of what we call economics but really law, at the University of Vienna, writes this little book, uh, which he basically solves the classic problem in economics of why is it that diamonds are so expensive and water was so cheap. Because it's on necessity grounds, the answer is it's not really obvious, right? Water, we need to live. Diamonds are cute and shiny, but they have virtually no function. Um, so why was this? And Menger, along with a couple other people we don't need to worry about, uh, roughly at the same time discovered what's called marginal utility. And if you took any economics classes, that's what you learn, marginal analysis. What matters is the last unit. So the first diamond is really, you know, because you're probably only going to buy one, right? Um, that's going to be really expensive. How much water will you consume? You know, probably gallons upon gallons. Don't do the 64-ounce thing. That was sort of a made-up story, I don't know if you know this, from some French water company back in the 1990s, has convinced the world you all need eight cup classes a day. It's actually not true and it's kind of unhealthy uh, <laughs> as well. But because we consume so much, it's basic, it's really cheap at the end. We value it very little. And this is what Manger discovers along with a couple other folks. So that's really his claim to fame in the history of economics, discovering the principle of marginal utility, that we price things based on the last unit. 
purchase, not the first. They also got into a debate in the 1880s about the proper role of methodology, the proper methodology for economics. He was one who largely believed in a priori theorizing, and this will be picked up with von Mises, for example, where you, you state a number of axioms that are self-evidently true, more or less, and you deduce the implications from it. What he's doing there is he's battling against what's known as the German historical school in, well, obviously Germany and Austria to a lesser extent, who are arguing, well, if we just collect lots of data and lots of stories about the world, we can induce, you know, by through induction, figure out what the laws of economics are. And von Mises is actually arguing it goes the other way. You, can, you come up with a theory and then you go look at the world. As a side note in that debate, and it's picked up a lot with modern Austrian economics down here, is he, he gets into this discussion of how rational people, when they interact, they end up creating outcomes they never anticipated, like the unintended consequences of you know, various types of actions. And that comes from Menger. And Hayek, in particular, will pick that up in the 1930s when Hayek edits Menger's collected works. And he notices it for the first time that something like money, for example, Menger will use. Well, where did money come from? At the time, and even into the present, lots of people think money is something that like, the Fed creates. But where did the value of the money come from? Because currently the, the, the dollar is not tied to anything other than wishes and hopes, really. The expectations about what the federal government is going to do. Well, a long time ago, it was based on gold, you know, or various other precious metals. Well, why did they end up being the, uh, the choices? Well, they have nice properties, they're shiny, and I guess that probably matters. Um, but they're also divisible, they're easy to check for the quality, things like that. Um, and he all largely argues it was an unintended process where people were trying to figure out how to make it easier to trade with one another. And one way that you do that is you figure out what everybody else wants. And gold emerged from this trading process through trial and error largely. And that, that's a theme in Menger's writings, specifically the gold or the money example does come from him, but then Hayek and others will pick it off, pick up on it. The second generation, Eugen von, von Bawerk and Friedrich Wieser are, it's kind of interesting, um, Wieser is a real like hardcore socialist in the Austrian tradition, which you usually don't ever hear about. Um, <laughs> he is actually probably most influential on Hayek. That's really who Hayek's teacher turns out to be, is Wieser more than anybody else. Well, Maverick is largely filling a lot of some of the gaps in, in Menger's thought, particularly he's well known for capital theory, and we'll get back to that later. Thinking about production as it takes, as it takes uh, or how it changes through time. Wieser, he's kind of all over the place. Mainly we know him because he come, came up with the term opportunity cost. It's, it's through him that it enters the discussion. The third generation, do you know von Mises? Is he, he's probably reasonably well known. So von Mises and Schumpeter, who he's a important character, but not really in the traditional Austrian school, other than he was born in Austria and studied with von Bauer. He was really the star student at the time. It wasn't von Mises, it's Schumpeter. is the one who ends up having, at least in the short run, a pretty big impact. Von Mises comes along and he does a number of things. Probably most famous is he raises a question that socialists, you know, meaning people who believe in the abolition of private property, um, says, well, how will you allocate resources if you don't have private property? And he famously declares, well, it's impossible to do it. I mean, you can still allocate resources, it's just not rational. It's largely a haphazard process. So that's von Mises' really major contribution. He writes these great big books. I don't know if you've ever looked at them. Human Action is his statement. It's like a thousand pages long. Um, and it's great reading because he'll be talking about some technical point in economics. And then he goes on some rants about the Nazis um, because they had chased him out. They had like, basically sort of hunted him down and he escaped just barely. Um, and as a side, they, for some reason, I don't know why dictatorships do this, they kept all his stuff, boxed it all up, and they turned up in Moscow after the Cold War ended. So now we actually have access to a lot of things that he was working on and his possessions. A lot of them have been brought to Hillsdale here in the United States, Hillsdale College up in Michigan. Fourth generation, Hayek is really the big figure there. Uh, Godfrey Haber, Fritz Machlup, Oscar Morgenstern, all of them end up in the United States in the primes of their career. Hayek wound up in Chicago and then we'll go back to Europe later on. Hayek's contributions are largely about information economics. When you think about what prices do, and we'll talk about this I don't know, the next slide and one after that, um, prices are really information aggregators, according to Hayek. And that's really a revolutionary thought. When you think about prices, what do they actually do? It's not usually, uh, I don't think it's portrayed well in principles classes, for example. Uh, they get, you know, we'll have millions of people trading buyers and sellers, supply and demand, <laughs> and, and all their decisions are affecting their price. They're nudging it up and they're nudging it down. And really what it's doing is collecting information so when we go to buy something, 
We don't really need to know exactly why the price went up. All we need to know is we're going to buy it or not. We're buying more or less of it. Hobbler I want to mention, mainly because he's neglected. He is the person who introduces um, subjective value theory to international trade theory. So when you learn comparative advantage, before Hobbler, you learn basically the labor theory of value kind of approach. That's where you know labor is the ultimate uh, metric of value. So it's the Marxist, Ricardo, David Ricardo type approach to the world. Hobbler says that's all wrong and develops it on his own. And that's where he should be mentioned more, but somehow he fell through the cracks in the history of economics. Mockliffe and Morgenstern are other people. Mockliffe teaches at Princeton for a long time. Morgenstern is famous for developing game theory. The, like, the, the seminal text in game theory is a theory of games and economic behavior or something like that. Morgenstern co-writes it with John von Neumann. It's, it's, game theory enters the discussion here in economics through the fourth generation Austrians. Morgenstern also was Hayek's like, research assistant earlier on. Because of the Second World War, most of the Austrians are actually not in Austria. To, to be honest, there are no Austrian economists in Austria nowadays. They've all fled. Largely because Hitler didn't like them. A lot of them were Jewish. And people like Hayek and Schumpeter are working hard to get them out safely. So here in the United States, you have Ludwig, well not in the United States, but South Africa and later in the United States. Ludwig Lachmann, that is really Hayek's main student when he's teaching in, within economics. Lachmann's approach to the world is uh, something you might want to call t radical uncertainty, um, extreme uh, subjectivism, where virtually nothing is knowable in some sense. The future is so um, <coughs> fuzzy that you can't even assign probabilities. You don't even know how to talk about the future in many ways. And that's what he's really concerned about. Murray Rothbard, you guys know him, he's like Mr. Libertarian. Uh, <laughs> that was his title for a long time. He is Mises' um, not really direct student, but really the heir, so to speak, in the United States. He studies at Columbia, me upon Mises is at NYU, but he really takes Mises' ideas and tries to make it more generalizable and understandable. So he rewrites human action without all the Nazi stuff. Uh, and tries to draw supply and demand pictures, and if you pick up his book, Man, Economy, and State, he's got some weird like demand curves because they have kinks in them and stuff. Um, but he's largely telling von Mises' economics about subjectivism and these things we'll talk about, trying to get to the largest audience as possible. Israel Kirshner is much more subtle. He is von Mises' student at NYU. Von Mises chaired his dissertation. What he really <laughs> spends his time on is really micro-theory, and particularly the theory of entrepreneurship. So he's kind of popular in business schools nowadays as well. What he's trying to explain is there's a, there's a logical gap in economic theory that we've never quite figured out. If you took principles of microeconomics, you learned the supply and demand curves, and you learned about something called perfect competition, where all the firms are really small, so they can't have any impact on price kind of stuff. So if they raise their price, they go out of business. If they lower, they capture everything. Well, in that model, turns out prices are just given, because everyone's so small, they can't affect anything. Uh, problem with that is prices are given. Well, where did they come from in the first place? And how do people move from one equilibrium to another? So for some reason, the supplier demand curve changes how, or shifts. How do you get from A to B? And, and Kirshner tries to offer an answer through entrepreneurship, that there's certain people out there, and it's actually everyone, if you believe it. Everyone is entrepreneurial, um, notices these changes and is the first to act upon it. So they notice profit opportunities that nobody else has noticed. And that's what Kirshner has spent his, spent his entire career really developing. Now, the current generation, Steve Horowitz has talked to you guys before, sort of indirectly, because he does, I know he does the Students for Liberty videos and stuff like that. He was down here a couple years ago. Pete Betke, who was on my dissertation committee, uh, Mary Rizzo at NYU. These guys are really pushing these ideas in new areas. Largely, the story through the first five generations is about business cycles and socialism. Can it work kind of questions. This generation, you know, with Betke, um, Horowitz, and Mary Rizzo, they're pushing in all different directions. Betke's early research, for example, is on transitional issues in Eastern Europe in the 1990s. He's turned his attention to bigger questions now about economic development. Horowitz does a lot of free banking stuff, and I don't know, maybe he talked about the economics of the family. That's his current book project. Taking some of these insights and explain how family dynamics work out. And Mary Rizzo does a lot of stuff in law and economics, and he's particularly right, um, interested right now in looking at the what do they call it, libertarian paternalism that we talk about in economics, nudge kind of stuff. Uh, he's really responding to them, talking about behavioral biases and decision making and how that applies to both the private and the public sector. And kind of slippery slope arguments that you get 
when you start saying we can kind of tinker with people here and there by changing their default rules with retirement accounts, things like that. All right, so now, Pete Betke um, has listed what he, has, what he calls the 10 propositions that make up Austrian economics. So those are what I'm going to spend most of the rest of the time is going through those 10 and if some of them are obvious, like this one, <laughs> I don't really want to spend much time on. Some of them are a little more subtle and nuanced, uh, maybe even a little more controversial. But this is really key for Austrian economics. More than any other of the schools of thought in economics, Austrians adhere um, practically religiously to the notion that it's only individuals that make decisions. All, uh, all explanations of social phenomena have to be reducible down to individuals and their decision making. We can still aggregate them and notice patterns and things like that, but it's only individuals who are, that's the basis of analysis. It's not groups, it's not families, so then we kind of differ from other schools of thought on that approach. Any questions about that one? That one I think is the most straightforward. Here, we're starting to really deviate from a lot of more mainstream economics. When we study markets, what we're talking about is a lot of the institutional framework that supports different types of markets. Why does the stock market operate the way it does versus, say, the gasoline market? What are the institutions? And this can be both formal and informal institutions that we're talking about. So it can be norms, cultural factors, things like that. That's all part of the story within um, Austrian economics. Does this seem like a intuitive prop an intuitive proposition? Because if you think about, well, if you took principles micro, you, you do your supply and demand curves, and you probably never really ask the question, well, where did this stuff come from? <laughs> you know, what are the implicit institutional assumptions that we make in order to, for an exchange to take place? The most obvious being you have to have some sort of property rights, whether actual formally enforced by courts in some sort of legal system, or at least informally um, recognized by other people trading. So even in, if you have markets, in formal markets where I steal something, there's still some recognized property rights if we're willing to make the trade. You might say they're not legitimate or something like that, but they're still recognized property rights. So this is really key, that the, the institutions that support markets becomes very focal for Austrian economics. And for a long time, that has nothing, um, there's no mention of that in much of economic theorizing or discussions. Now it's become a little more trendy. This comes from Hayek, and a pretty good uh, book that's probably worth reading called The Counter-Revolution in Science. Facts aren't what you think they are. <laughs> and all facts are interpreted through some sort of theory, is what Hayek will argue. There really is no objective truth that is out there. It's what you perceive things to be. <coughs> and now that's going to wreak havoc, but... We talk about facts, facts about what? Um, what we observe out in the world when we're talking, when we're trying to make decisions about, you know, we observe prices and things like that, but what they actually mean is a whole different question. Pricing. Yeah. Okay. Right. I mean, the facts are, you know, subject to. We have to interpret information because if you just hear things like, "Oh, it's four dollars for a cup of coffee," not, it's not very helpful. Actually, it doesn't really tell you anything. You need to know more about what's happening. So Hayek um, really pushes this notion of we have to be really subjectivist about the world. A lot of what happens when we make decisions is our own interpretations of things. It's how we filter things through our minds. So Hayek, for example as an undergraduate, writes a little book about how the brain processes information. Then he sits on it for 30 years and then publishes it. Turns out it's actually not too bad of a book. Some of the specifics are false now, we know, but his general theory of how we interpret information seems to be accepted by a lot of people, including like Nobel laureates in, in like biology and whatnot, have drawn off his work and go, yeah, this actually makes a lot of sense. Because what we do is we, we process information and the little neurons fire up and we begin to categorize information, and if we keep coming across the same information, those neurons work, and they, it's like a filing cabinet. Um, if we ignore information, right, we don't know how to process it, and it gets discarded. That's basically his theory of how the mind works. So it's about reorganizing things to try to, searching for patterns that may or may not actually exist. Because remember, as humans, we're really good about seeing things that don't exist. We want patterns, even though there are none there. Like if you're into sports, there is no such thing as the hot hand, for example, no matter how hard you want to believe that. It's not true. But we like it. We're like, oh, there's hot streaks. And my beloved Steelers are on a hot streak. No, they're not. Okay, they're just, you know, the Giants sucked last week, right? Uh, <laughs> that's all it was. I'm sure they were distracted. You know, they had other things to worry about. Um, but that's, you know, something we want to keep in mind with the Austrians. They take this proposition very, very seriously. So building off it, when you go to the micro side, 
means both utility and cost are subjective. And that clearly distinguishes them from everyone else until the present. Because when you draw a demand curve, for example, it is subjective. It's about your preferences and how much you're willing to pay for various goods and services at different prices based on your, your resource constraints. Generally speaking, the, the supply curve is actually a real cost curve. It is based on something measurable. You would go to, it's about the firm, so you look at how much they spend producing things and you figure average cost and fixed cost and marginal cost and all those types of things. And then you draw the curves. So in standard micro theory, you have the subjective world of the demand curve intersecting with the objective world of supply. Austrians will deny that that's actually true. They take really seriously our costs are subjective. It's, it's, the most, it's like the cornerstone of economic reasoning. It is opportunity costs. We all remember opportunity costs? So I can just randomly call somebody and they'll tell me. <laughs> Should I go over it? All right. Hmm? Big no, you're in the front. Um, <laughs> opportunity cost is what you the next best thing mm -hmm. that you give up. And why can't you measure it? Because it's subjective. But why? How did you did you do the next best thing? Oh, no. no it's purely a forward looking concept. Mm -hmm. You make your best guesses about what to do in the future. And obviously, mm -hmm. because of constraints and we don't have time machines, you can only do one. What that next best alternative was totally formed in your own mind. What could have happened? You actually have no idea. You have a good guess, and you're probably reasonable most of the time, but it turns out costs actually are subjective. So when firms use things, uh, capital or labor, for example, they could have used it for something else. So it's not just purely the wage, or however the user cost of capital happens to be. It is something that was just totally in your mind, and after the moment of choice, it's gone. Can you go back and try again? No, oh, no, time's arrow and all that problem. Right? You only move one direction. Um, so costs actually are subjective. This will wreak havoc on your supply curve, it turns out. So for example, cost curves are, you know, costs are separated from profits. You, you, know, you define profits as revenues minus cost. Well, if costs are subjective uh, and, and part of the opportunity cost is foregone profits, what are we to do? Curse the world? <laughs> it's, not, it's not a bad solution, actually. Um, <laughs> at least part of economic theory. Uh, it really wreaks havoc on how we do things. That's why we don't like it. But well, so uh, everybody has different um, contexts for their for their exchanges. For example, mm -hmm. one of the reasons I have my job here is because I like the location. I'm close to my parents. That's not something you can put a price on. Yeah. But it's certainly part of the decision making. Yeah, you could make a guess. You could say, well, someone offered me whatever. Maybe I would move or something like that. Right. But it, it's much fuzzier. And that's part of why people don't like a lot of Austrian economics, because you don't get the clean precision that you would get from more standard models. It says, well, it does matter. You've got to take people's beliefs real seriously. This is Hayek's really biggest contribution, and why he's famous, and why he won a Nobel, one of the reasons why he won a Nobel Prize. It's the notion of what the price system actually does. And I mentioned it before, but we'll go over it again. Is you have all these people out there. You know, when you were trying to like come up with a cu you know a cup of coffee, well, how many people are involved actually in that transaction? You got the Civil War folks in like you know parts of Africa, right? We got to think about them, you know, because they do this kind of stuff, right? Destroy the coffee crop, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, how in the world it gets here? You got the roasting, you got whatever Starbucks does, all this other stuff. But all that information is just bundled down into something that's one dimensional. It's called a price, and all I have to do is figure out: is it going up or is it going down? Do I want to buy more? Do I want to buy less of it? It was Hayek who really drew attention to this fact that prices make us a lot smarter than we really are. Because we don't really need to know anything about going in, uh, in the world, right? I mean, you can live a blissful life and ignore lots of things. You don't need to, coffee prices go up. Do you really like go online, go to Google, and go, what's happening, type in all the coffee producing countries? You go, well, probably something screwed up in Brazil, right? Um, they produce lots of coffee, except it's low quality, so we don't actually consume much of it here. Um, but do you do any of that? Oil prices go up? you figure out which country is in trouble? The Nigerians, again, cutting the lines? Um, something like that? No, we don't. All we have to do is say, OK, prices went up. I'm going to adjust my behavior if I want to, You know, subject to the, the, your income constraints. And that's really key to keep in mind. Because when we start playing games, when we, when we mess with prices, like we restrict them somehow. So think about what's happened in New Jersey recently and the law in place that you couldn't raise pr gas prices 10%. Isn't that what the law was? Mm -hmm. right, it's a price gouging law. Well, what happened? Gas lines. All right, gas lines. 
prices needed to go a lot higher to clear the market so there wouldn't be any lines. But we don't let it happen. Virginia, we have a law like that too, if I remember correctly. Prices can only rise by so much as, as the storm's approaching and then they're frozen um, until the emergency is over. If you don't let prices adjust, you are effectively throwing information away. In the United States, for example, President Ford, his first major um, act as a member of the House, banned, successfully got a law placing bans on future trading in onions. That's exciting stuff, I know. Did you know that there are no future contracts for onions in the United States? The idea was these future traders are destabilizing. You hear it all the time. <laughs> Go plot the variability of onion prices, and guess what you are going to find? It's fun to look at. I do it sometimes in classes. It makes the oil market look stable, actually. Why? Why is it so volatile in the onion market? They seem like such innocent little things, right? Because there's all this information that they can't trade upon. So keep that in mind. When you tinker with the price system, you're tinkering with, it, tinkering with information. And this often blows up in our face. And that'll be one of the other propositions um, coming up. This one is the big contribution from von Mises. There's got to be some private property. Meaning, I mean, needs a protection in the old school sort of um, terminology, but this means capital goods. And notice the word rational economic calculation here. For us to have any, you know, anybody can allocate resources randomly, right? Just flip a coin and make a decision. In order for it to move in the direction of the highest valued user, you need some sort of system of private property rights. Now, why is that? Anyone have any thoughts? You may have seen this one. I know two of you have, but I won't pick on them. Uh, <laughs> Think about what property does. What's its function, economically speaking? Does it provide incentives for you to do things? Now, is there any graffiti in your parents' um, bathroom? Why not? Have you been to the ones around here? What's the difference? Why don't you like write crude things on your parents' walls? Respect? <laughs> yeah, it could be. Or, and the respect came from like what? A belt or a boot or a <laughs> <laughs> or just pure, pure fear of your mother? Um, if she got really upset. Right, that's part of what property does. When you own something, you take care of it. Now keep that in mind, right? You're going to take care of this. You know, you, if you mess up at home, they will make you fix it. You will bear the cost. When you do dumb things in the bathrooms around here, who pays for it? You or do you get to spread it out over many, many people? Right. You spread it out. And obviously, if um, the incentives are misaligned, you're not bearing all the costs. You're going, to run, you're going to have some real resource allocation problems. So that's part of the story. So now once you have ownership, right, you're going to try to take care of it. Well, how do you know where to allocate things? How do you know where, where you, where's the best use of capital? Should we put more, like think about the U.S. now. Should we put more towards green technology or not? How do you make that decision? Prices. Right, prices, profits. Is it profitable or not? And even within, if it's profitable, there's different ways, there's virtually an infinite number of ways that you can produce things. And engineers can come up with all kinds of cool ways to produce all kinds of stuff. I'm sure they can produce something that could land on Mars and take off from Mars. But is it, is it feasible, economically speaking? How expensive is it to get something to take off from Mars? I don't know if you know the gravity, it ain't happening, right? Okay. <laughs> Not anytime soon, it's just too expensive. So that's what we're trying to get at here with this sixth proposition. Once you own stuff um, and you're going to make it better, you're going to think about how, how to allocate it. If you don't own it, what do you care how you allocate it? If you don't bear the cost associated with it. So if it's not my money, I will invest in Solyndra, right? Why not? What do I care? Go ahead. So does that suggest that insurance is a bad idea? Why? Because you're distributing the cost over why you group outside of the actual event of when the product needs to be purchased? Um, not necessarily, because if a lot of people do it, they understand it. They all, I mean, when you sign up for insurance, you know that you're not going to necessarily use it. I mean, really, and that's what they're hoping, actually, that you never, ever call. You just keep paying every year or whatever it is. Um, but if you're willing to spread the risk among other voluntary um, transactors, then it's not a big deal. It's a way to pull, and the idea is to pull some of the risk. So we're all in the same industry or something like that. We know there's a potential for a real problem. We don't know with any certainty which one of us will have the problem, so we try to shift the risk around a bit. Um, so then we actually kind of like insurance because it also goes back to the fifth point. Because when you see the prices and what people are willing to, 
to spend on insurance, it's telling us what they think the risks are as well. That's one of the nice things about how like insurance markets work and stock markets and whatnot, is they give us some sense what people are thinking. Like with yesterday, I don't know, you guys look at the in-trade market at all, for the presidential mm -hmm. election, it appears to have predicted 50 out of 50 states five weeks ago, um, because people bet with their money. Right? Anybody can go on CNN and Fox and stuff and just yam yammer on and on and on, um, because that's good television. But when it came down to really putting their money down, then you notice the markets had, saw, you know, had made a pretty good prediction quite a while ago about this. Uh, you better, I mean, Nate Silver's got a lot of press coverage or whatnot. Um, but his is, you know, sort of updated recently. He had certainly did not predict what happened, you know, all over a month ago. Here is the real person that contribution. This is the terminology. Entrepreneurial discovery. And he defines entrepreneurship as you're alert to previously unnoticed profit opportunities. That's one of the ways he frames it in his books about this is that you, know, you just happen to be doing something and you realize there's an, in, um, an inefficiency in the system that no one else has noticed and you act upon it. When you see inefficiencies in markets, it's always a profit opportunity for somebody. Often it's the first person um, to notice it. The first mover is the one who gets the gain from all this. So Kirchner said this is really how markets work. They're always evolving, they're dynamic, so it's not the static setting of supply and demand. And it's because people are relentlessly pursuing profit opportunities, and they're trying to find them. They realize that they're, you know, there's something not quite right. There's a production technique that could be adapted or adopted that would you know, raise profits. And that's what entrepreneurship is about for um, Kersner. Now, Schumpeter, who I didn't really mention too much because he's a marginal player in the Austrian school in many ways, he actually kind of looks at the world differently. His is the, fa he thinks of, uh, what is it? the famous phrase is creative destruction. What entrepreneurs do is they don't notice existing inefficiencies. They create problems. Right? They come along with new technologies and destroy the existing markets. And he's got very colorful language that he uses when he discusses it. But the idea is this relentless pursuit of coming up with you know, new investments, um, new technologies, new inventions, new innovations. That's the Schumpeterian version of entrepreneurship. Kirshner has always argued they're actually complements to each other. Uh, I don't know if I believe him or not. Uh, but he has said they're not really that different. This, you know, this notion that I noticed that I was more alert to a, um, an inefficiency is also why, you know, Schumpeter may argue that that's why they created the new technology. They noticed there was something not quite right where they could make some money. So that's where Kirchner ends up, um, and a lot of Austrians focusing on this. Right? It's a process. That's the key phrase. It comes from von Mises. Uh, the market is a process. It's not some stable equilibrium. That markets are always changing and left to their own devices because of people pursuing profits, consumers trying to figure out ways to be uh, maximize, you know, obtain more utility at lower cost, so they're searching for different types of goods to consume. So those are the main micro propositions. On the macro side, this also distinguishes the Austrians from a lot of contemporary theorizing. It's, money is not neutral. It means changes in the money supply affect real things. Money is said to be neutral when if you change the money supply so the Fed prints up some more money, only prices change and nothing else. Relative prices do not change. So if today it's $2 for an orange and $1 for an apple, and we say double the money supply, tomorrow the ratio would be 4 to 2. Ms. Shedlock says that because um, increase in money supply is an increase in credit as opposed to just increasing in the green pieces of paper. Yeah, I mean, that's largely what we do nowadays. Um, but it's, money is kind of weird. Uh, because there's not that much of it, you'd be surprised how little of it's actually in circulation. It's largely credit-based, and it might not even be credit-based. It's largely uh, uh, fictional account statements. Mm -hmm. Like so, when the Fed has tr tripled the uh, monetary base or so over the past few years, all it has done is added credits to bank balance sheets. There's actually no new money printed up. Mm -hmm. um, and the most common bill in circulation, I'm surprised to find this out, is a hundred dollar bill. Actually. That's 75% of all currency in circulation or so is a hundred dollar bill. Well, Misha's point is as long as that money's parked in not yeah. So when the bank finally decides yep. to use that money in some way that it actually increases the money supply. Yeah, that, the, money, the money multiplier process. Because the bank only has to keep a certain percentage of the dollars in the bank at all times. Yeah, and that's, uh, and that's what we think that, you know, our concern now with the Federal Reserve is it's dumped all this money into the system, you know, pay, you know sort of fictitious, just, you know, computer money. But what if the banks begin to loan out more and more? What will happen then? Yeah, that's, the, that's what we expect. And we, we, have a, we keep our fingers crossed that uh, Chairman Bernanke will stop it. With the one, he only has one tool he can actually really use on this one, 
or so, and it's going to be he's, the, the plan is to raise the interest rates that the Federal Reserve pays on excess reserves. That's really the plan, and I'm not optimistic about this one uh, because how do you know when to do it? Kind of problem. If the, if they start if they do it too soon, we can go back into recession. If they do it too late, we have um, some mild inflation. I'm not it's not going to be hyperinflation or anything. I don't know, I'm extremely skeptical of that. But you could get five six percent inflation, which is pretty. I mean, for you guys, you've never seen anything like that. I don't know, you might panic or something. Because <laughs> more or less your whole life has been hovering around like 2%. Um, so it would be triple what you're used to. So seeing how people respond to that. This proposition is key to understand the business cycle theory. So micro is largely a question about comparative economic systems, why socialism probably won't work as well as capitalism. This is really the debate about with Keynes. It's thinking about monetary neutrality. So Hayek you know, steals this idea, well, you it, but it comes from Richard Cantillon, another guy who wrote back in the 1750s or so. And he says, well, when the money goes in the system, what happens? So the central bank gives money to banks, and then they loan it out, and those people spend money, right? Well, what happens to the prices that they're spending their money on? Well, it goes up. Then, then, then those people who got the money, they spend it on whatever they like. Well, they're, whatever they like, those prices begin to rise. The, the structure of relative prices is changing now because of the introduction of new money. We tell the story in like principles classes and, and, and to be honest in intermediate classes as if when the money supply process takes place, everyone's money goes up. But that's not really how it works. It's injected somewhere into the system and those people who get it first, it has the highest purchasing power it's going to have, they get to spend it on whatever they like, driving those prices up, so the next set of consumers are now facing a different set of relative prices. And you don't want to be the last person at the end of that train um, because the prices have changed and dollars getting you know, devalued because you've increased it. That's a lot of their story about the business cycle. It's the introduction of new money. I mean, and there's debate within Austrian economics about this, whether or not this is just a central banking problem, or it's a problem of fractional reserve banking. So the Mises Institute crowd tends to be concerned about fractional reserve banking more than anything else. Because any bank you know, can do this. It doesn't have to be the central bank increasing the money supply or increasing credit. Any bank could do it. And if you think about how we got into our, part of how we got into the mess anyway, in 2008, is more or less the credit multiplier is infinite at this point. Because what they were able to do is, if you, you know, a, a house is credit, and a house can be divided an infinite number of times, and that's largely what they were doing. It's actually kind of cool in a sad way, but cool anyway. Um, that they were able to subdivide and continually subdivide houses to generate more and more credit. So that's you know, something that we think this is actually really an important concept to keep in mind, how it's going to change the structure of relative prices. This is from von Bobrick, this is Hayek, this is um, von Mises, this is anybody, you know, this is Steve Horowitz, if you read uh, coordination problems or blogs, always talking about this stuff. The real, pro the real trick for an economy to work is, and I'm going to try to keep it simple, you have workers and you've got capital. And they're both very specific. For economy to be, you know, sustain economic growth, you've got to match up the right types of capital, physical capital, with the right types of labor. And that's not easy to do, actually. Because you think now, like, the structural unemployment by lots of accounts have been rising in the United States, which means lots and lots of people have skills that nobody wants to hire. That's not a problem easily solved. And it's not just a problem of old people, because that's what we always think about it. Technological, technological change has come around. Now, old people have lost their skills, and for reasons, maybe just because they're old, they can't learn anything. You know, some, you know, some sort of ageism going on here. Um, that they, you know, we're just going to have to provide some kind of workers' compensation kind of thing, you know, unemployment and whatnot. But we're actually it's a huge problem with recent college graduates. It's a problem with recent law school graduates. They're getting skills that nobody wants. I mean, it's not just, even though it was the last semester, 80% of college graduates moved home, it's actually not a problem of the recession. This trend has been shifting in this direction that predates the recession by a number of years. Even before the recession came, it was around 50% of college students were moving back home. Well, why can't they find jobs? What's the problem? You got a fancy degree, right? Their skills aren't in demand. Their skills aren't in demand. Right? This is a real issue that we're facing. Uh, within higher education, people are borrowing, you know, specifically if you add in they're borrowing a lot of money to get degrees that have no payoff. So what do you do with that? I mean, I tease philosophy majors, they're obviously one of them one time this problem. Uh, also psychology and communications, there was a study done last year that said those are two majors for lots of people that have actually negative rates of return at this point. 
because after like 1990 or so, so many more new, new majors have entered the market in those two fields that they've driven the wages so low it's not actually worth to go in college anymore. You won't get your money back on that one for those two majors. But how do we fix this? Right? This is the question about Proposition 9. This is what I've actually I've thought about for a long time. My undergraduate thesis was largely about this kind of question. Thinking about how you match up the capital structure with um, heterogeneous capital, especially because it's weird with capital because sometimes they're complements and sometimes they're substitutes. And it's like labor and capital. Sometimes capital is your friend and it makes you more productive. Sometimes it replaces you. <laughs> it's not your friend anymore. Well, uh, PhDs pretty much are, capital, are, are negative degrees return relative to master's degrees. Um, we, not for all fields, but yeah. But the reason is because people are going for the PhDs really love the subject. Yeah. That's kind of, again, yeah. kind of hard to price. Yeah. The same thing may be true that people are going to college not so much for the, for the getting money when they get a job mm -hmm. as they like going to college and meeting other people, marrying someone, that's what. Yeah, drugs, sex, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, like, particularly in economics, I'm just saying a little better than the other areas. But it's, you take a huge deduction, reduction in salary by going into academics. But it's much more profitable to go into the private sector. But then again, I have a different type of schedule and stuff like that. So that's a lot of preferences. Um, you know, I'd have to like come in before noon, for example, and get a real job. Uh, <laughs> where now most days I don't usually come until about noon. Um, but this is really, I think, the key macroeconomic proposition around the Austrian school, is how do you match up capital, which sometimes is very specific and has absolutely no other use, and you need very specific skills, but when that also, remember, leaves you open to real problems when technological change takes place. Because if you're hyper-specialized, um, you can be replaced very easily in many cases when the new technology comes. Uh, so you need to you know, not get too specific, not too much heterogeneity. You want a general skill set that allows you to easily move from one area to another. Because you get, like I said, if you get too specialized, you have real problems that you're, gonna, you're probably going to confront at some point. Proposition 10 is what a lot of current thinking and discussion and books and papers and whatnot in Austrian economics is really about. Thinking about social institutions that emerge, particularly that lead to social cooperation, peaceful social cooperation. So a lot of you know, my cohort from George Mason and the current groups there, that's what we've largely spent our professional lives on is thinking about this question. How is it that people with like imperfect information, bumbling along, pursuing their self-interest, somehow end up cooperating with each other through voluntary means? I'll, I mean, I mean, some of you might have heard like Pete Leeson's work about pirates and what are they all up to and his crazy thoughts about that. I say that because he was my college, he was my grad school roommate. Uh, <laughs> last week, um, was the last week Ed Stringham was here or two weeks ago? Last week. Really? Seems like that's a long time ago. My other grad school roommate, he was here talking about social institutions solving problems of with the gold rush in California. Initially, you know, you've heard the stories, the wild, wild west kind of thing. Uh, how did private organizations, uh, particularly private police, emerge to solve problems? Because, and if you believe his story anyway, that there was a lot of demand for help, but the state just wasn't there. San Francisco went from a nothing town to a huge town in about a two-year period, for example, and that's mainly what he's interested in. And, you know, private police today, it's actually a huge growing industry, it has been for up to almost two decades. When you think of private communities, for example, where you know, they're gated communities, they've hired their own security force. We have some kind of you know, private security here on campus. You know, JMU police can't do lots of things, but they can do some other things. Uh, Pete Leeson, like I said, did the stuff with the pirates. About, you know, here, he, his argument is, uh, is that by self-selection, this is the most unruly group you can possibly imagine. But how come they played nice with each other? And it wasn't just because they were strapped on the ship together. You really had no other choice. Uh, they had democratic constitutions, for example. They voted who the captain was. They also, if you got out of line, had very public and horrific displays of what happens. So you only have to see someone like, you know, getting their intestines cut out once to say, I'm going to play nice, right? <laughs> but this was all largely privately done. They operated outside the law. Um, this also, Chris Coyne, uh, you might know him, up, up there, George Mason as well, doing about humanitarian assistance and how often um, this is kind of the, the, the backfire, but the flip side of all this is the unintended consequences sometimes are terrible. You were hoping for really good outcomes, but you ended up with something bad. So a lot of humanitarian assistance struggles with this. 
So, for example, in 1994, when the Rwandan genocide took place, uh, was it Doctors Without Borders? Is that how that translates? Um, was there, and they're trying to help out these poor people who, you know, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed and the family's fleeing and whatnot. But it turned out the people who were committing the crime, when the tide turned, were hiding in the camps with the doctors and claiming to be parts of the other tribe. Right? It was a Hutu Tutsi kind of thing, or the ethnic groups. Um, they actually had to make the decision, and they did, if I remember correctly, to leave because they felt so, they didn't think it was ethical for them to stay there and provide medical service for the people who had killed, you know, the high-end estimates, about 800,000 people in about 100 days or so, was it? With, like, uh, machetes and stuff. It was pretty brutal. Um, this, is off, this is really a big deal and a lot of humanitarian assistance because often these camps are set up where the, the people who are being persecuted go to, but you're a sitting duck, actually, for whoever's persecuting you. And humanitarian groups are always addressing this issue of how do they not actually make things worse by showing up. One, sometimes they provide supplies inadvertently to whoever the groups who are doing the horrible things. This was an issue in the Sudan and Darfur, for example. Um, you know, how do you just not, like, they just line up near the camps and they just like shooting, you know, like literally shooting ducks. Right, as people are trying to migrate there, they're getting killed to try to get to the safe havens because the, the people committing the atrocities know where the safe havens are. So how do you fix this kind of stuff? And the last proposition 10, which I think is really the most interesting thing, what got me interested in Austrian economics, whatever it was, 15 years ago or so, uh, was thinking about this. How these institutions, you know, they often it's for cooperation, but not always. We're interested actually in both sides. When social cooperation will go awry and lead to um, all kinds of problems as well, and how do we fix them? Any questions about that one? And I can go on and on about this kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, sort of self-governing societies, um, unintended consequences of various policies, you know, things like that. And finally, the easiest one of all. <laughs> what questions do you have? Go ahead. So, uh, going back to, like, you know, Proposition 10, actually, um, to, like, so does that really reflect, like, Austrians' belief in sort of, like, like, the role of government? Because it seems like with Proposition 10, you're saying, like, you know, there's a lot of cases where people can, like, you know, get along and interact mm -hmm. without, you know, like, the government making a law saying, like, do yeah. this. So does that translate into, like, you know, a lot of political philosophy? Yeah, like, that's yeah. why, I mean, mostly Austrians are associated with libertarianism in some form or another. Right. Whether it be, like, classical liberalism, probably more mainline right. libertarianism, or even the sort of anarchist crowd. Uh, and this is a lot of it, is how far can we go when private organizations solving problems? Particularly, you know, it's always about public good problems. Um, you know, public goods are usually easy. Most people agree that lots of public goods can be provided for privately. Uh, but it's questions of police, for example. Um, Dave Scarbeck, who's, I forget, he's in London now, I forget where, at University College London, I think. You know, thinking about gangs as well, how this, and how this, how they solve their problems. Um, go back historically, I mean like 1500s, 1300s, 1400s, stuff like that. How credit was provided without any kind of formal legal structure behind it across couple of now modern countries, particularly around the Mediterranean how there was this huge elaborate trading network and all these sophisticated contracts were being written and it was largely a reputation based system. So yeah, I mean that's why a lot of it ends up being um, you know, some kind of libertarian story. But it also, many of them point out the government in many ways is one of these things as well. We would actually, you know, as much as we like to hope that like smart people got together 200 years ago, 200 plus years ago, designed a constitution, it's not really how it worked out. Uh, there's some vague rules and they've changed things and it continues to evolve in, what it, it, in its scope and scale. Um, would Austrian economics or the Austrian economic thought be like the derivative, uh, the derivative concept for like the term austerity in economics? You mean like balance and budget kind of stuff? No, I mean, well, kind of. I mean, austerity is in the policies and like the actual policy, like what they're doing in Europe and such. Uh, well. Or do they? Are they not related? They just sound similar. Well, the first thing they would say is there's no real austerity taking place in Europe. Um, it's, it's a slowdown in growth or something like that, or it's promise cuts that haven't happened. Um, but they would go back to, I think, the previous slide. The concern there is, let's go back to the, really this question again, what's happening there? Because part of it's about tax rates and how it's changing relative prices. And that's the concern, you know, if they're going to cut services, you know, are taxes changing? What's the implied tax rates? Because remember also if they're running more debt, and they all are, um, that's also changing future tax rates implicitly. Um, so they're, they're skeptical, one, that it's actually happening, but they're generally supportive of it. 
because you one of the problems is like when you're running debt is how I mean as much as we'd like to believe it no one is really good at figuring out what future tax rates are um, so this is going to increase uncertainty about the world this is going to mess up the prices because they're not really reflecting what's going to happen in the future and um, so there is some concern about you know, actually how the, the specific implementation of the austerity policies is going I said it's not really I mean best I can tell nothing has happened in terms of cutting in England the numbers, I mean, they're still spending more now than they ever have. Um, it just, maybe it's, it's like in the United States, a cut isn't what you and I think it is. <laughs> a cut in the United States is a slowdown in the growth rate, uh, but it's still a positive amount each year. Uh, so, I was just going to say, usually it's just like a, a cut in like proposed, like, yeah, that's the other thing. Budget. It's for, yeah, the baseline for 10 years, and you go, well, who can, 10 year budgets are not um, uh, enforceable in any way. Um, so I don't know why anyone uses them, and they often usually make heroic assumptions about no business cycles, growth is going to be higher than it ever has been historically, um, kind of things. But they'll say like, oh, well, there'll be no business cycle for 10 years. That's like never happened in U.S. history, okay? <laughs> kind of thing. And they always underestimate um, the uh, increase in government expenditures. So there was a report that came out at the beginning of the semester that said, well, why were they, they looked at the 10-year projections uh, back at the beginning of the Bush years and said, why were they so far off? 50% or so of the blame they assigned to was government grew faster than they had anticipated. And that's, you know, that's, uh, that does not include the increase associated with the recession and the stimulus bill and all that. That's in mean, that separate category. That was about 25% of the change, because that's just temporary, and in theory, most of that will disappear. Um, only 25% of it was because of tax revenues not meeting what their expectations were. It's almost all expenditure base. Did you have something? Me? Yeah. Oh, um, I did actually. <laughs> I don't know how you knew, but um, I actually, one of my favorite things to kind of prattle on people about is, I remember you touched on a credit-based economy, mm -hmm. and I, li I like to, I mean, we, we have, would you say it's accurate, we have a credit-based economy? Pretty close. It will never go pure credit, I don't think. Um, largely because of informal markets. Mm -hmm. People still want to pay cash for certain things. But that one I can't imagine. I mean, I can't imagine, for example, drug dealers with little things on their hip they can swipe. Oh. Um, <laughs> you know? But it, it definitely the actual physical amount of money I can imagine being continually declined. Yeah, I just had one, uh, more, more, more question. You had one of the propositions on uh, money. Um, what is usually like the Austrian stance, just like on monetary policy in general, um, you know, because like, like right now you have like, you know, like the whole like Fed stuff, and it's yeah. got a lot of attention now with like auditing the Fed and stuff like that. And, you know, I don't know a whole lot about it. But, you, know. you can probably break it down two camps, broadly speaking. So the one largely associated with, I think, the von Mises Institute is the problem is fractional reserve banking itself. Okay. The other school of thought is like what Steve Horowitz is associated with it, and Hayek is the inspiration for this, is something called free banking. So instead of having a monopoly supplier of the currency, you have banks competing. I mean, the government still can under Hayek's system, uh, best I can tell anyway. The government can still issue currencies, but now they have to compete against other, um, like, you know, Bank of America dollars or something like that, or Wells Fargo dollars, and let the best currency win. I mean, Hayek, if you read him, I think closely, sometimes it's missed, is he's actually not about abolishing the state in any way. What he's interested in is the state always competing, you know, always free entry is held. So the state can try to, you know, provide credit, money, but if it's not efficient at it, don't let it do it. Let it have to compete with everybody else. Um, so the free banking people, like uh, Steve Horowitz, really want to abolish the Fed and end up with a um, system, like I said, with private banks largely supplying their own currencies. People don't think that it's kind of crazy, obviously, um, because like how many currencies would circulate in Harrison or something like that? I mean, could you imagine like exchange rates? Because I say, think about it, think of international trade and the, the exchange rates, um, you know, euros to pesos and stuff like that. Um, how, how would that work at a really, really micro level in a town like Harrison or something smaller? Uh, would we end up, you know, one claim is we'd end up with one currency anyway because of uh, the benefits of everyone using the same currency. Which would be so great that we'd end up with some monopoly provider anyway. It might be the Fed, but it could just be, you know, like I said, Wells Fargo or something like that. So that's a question of um, scale. And it hasn't been tried too much in history. Um, Scotland is probably the best known example up to like 1840-something or other where they had competing banks before the Bank of England took over. And it seemed to be very stable. 
Um, you know, part of it is, if you could imagine, the currency probably to work would need some sort of basis. Like, yeah, like if I just start handing out like Subrix or something, it, you, know, you guys aren't going to take them, right? Unless you've been you know, drinking or something, right? <laughs> I hand them out like Friday nights on Port Republic, maybe people would take them to drink. But <laughs> you will sell your services for your own Subrix if you back your current currency. Yeah, I have to back it somehow. But me just printing out my own money, no one's going to take I have to come up with some asset, you know, some kind of tangible or not to support this. And that's one of the big concerns, is how would that work out? Did you have something in the back? Uh, I was going to ask the same question about monetary policy, but I am sort of interested. I think a lot of us feel like um, politically, separate from economics, like libertarianism maybe, is not so much what we hear in like a, a G-Posh classroom. And I think a lot of us might feel economically similar that there's a sort of dominance of, or a lot of talk of Keynes and things like that in economics here. Like, is there, are there any like major like misconceptions or trends you don't like in the, in the education of economics sort of at the college level? You see? <laughs> I have like two classes devoted to that. Uh, I mean, semester long classes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the one we tended at are the institutional assumptions are not so explicit a lot of times. In a normal economics class, you draw supply and demand, and you say it works under a bunch of, you know, so, so much stringent assumptions. And then you relax the assumptions, and you show markets fail all the time, and that's sort of the end of the story. So uh, my one class is totally devoted to the proposition that that's actually when I prefer economic analysis to begin. And it's kind of like, I think it was the seventh proposition here, is any time there's uh, some sign of market failure, that provides incentives for somebody to respond to it. The default rule doesn't necessarily have to be some regulatory agency or something like that. If you see, you know, people don't like being polluted upon, right? Uh, that provides an opportunity for someone to try to solve that problem. People will pay good money, like breathe clean air and water. And wit you know, witness all the water bottles on campus, right? <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so that's one thing where it doesn't, it's not really appreciated, I think, very much in most undergraduate classes. In the other class, it's, it's like pseudo, it's kind of like Austrian, but it's also Bob's weird worldview. Um, that's really what I should call the class. It's whatever the hell I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> but I think it needs, the Austrians, I mean, if you go back, actually, I'll go back one more slide here for a second. If you go back to this, this, this third and fourth generation, <coughs> von Mies has never really had an academic appointment in Vienna. He was like an adjunct. <coughs> His real job was with the Chamber of Commerce. But what he used to do every week is invite like this crowd, these are all connors, but sociologists, political scientists, and other ones back to his office and then some coffee house near there. And they would talk for the wee hours of the night about stuff. So, I mean, my course is largely an interdisciplinary one where I draw a lot on sociology, for example. There's some famous sociologists. Uh, Max Weber being probably the biggest of all, who is heavily, it, it, really, if you had to place him economically speaking, and he kind of thought of himself as an economist, he's here with von Mises. Right. Schumpeter writes, you know, a book that Weber actually, uh, what we call it now, um, like sponsored for a book series. He wanted Schumpeter's views on certain things in economics. Um, what Weber did is a lot of economic sociology, and he's kind of got lost. So I try to bring him back into into the classes. I mean, that part I think is really missing. And you know, professionally speaking, I have to look down my nose at the sociologist. Uh, part of my union card. Uh, <laughs> But as a practical matter, like, there's a lot of really good research done that I think complements, thinks about, um, you know, particularly, let's go back to some of the macro stuff just for a second. Back to Proposition 10, they, I mean, that, this idea is really developed in sociology initially. Back in the 30s and 40s and stuff, sociologists were taking this real seriously. Um, by the time the rest of economics caught on, you know, they're 60 years ahead, of <coughs> looking at the various organizations and how they end up coming up with some kind of order. So, I mean, those are the two areas, I think, where they, they missed the boat. The Austrians are much more willing to entertain um, the other social sciences and steal relentlessly the ideas if necessary. Um, also, the idea about the more traditional economic institutions, what's their role? You could also add a whole class, like I will be adding shortly, on economics and philosophy. Where a lot of uh, uh, Austrians are much more, like Rothbard, for example, was like an amateur philosopher in many ways. Hayek published a lot in philosophy journals. For example, Becky, I think technically his title now is Professor of Economics and Philosophy up at George Mason. Um, so that's another area, and that actually I'm going to end up adding as a new course in a year, I think. Uh, markets and social justice and open to everybody. It's actually intentionally designed to not just be business people. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say because I'm getting recorded, though. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Did you have a question?
Yeah, I was wondering what your thoughts were on the cause of the business cycle. Um, so the Austrian one is largely an interest rate story, where the Federal Reserve or whatever it is, the central bank uh, or any banks, end up putting credit out there, and that, and that lowers the interest rates. That's this question here. So now the producers are getting the wrong signal because in the Austrian story, interest, like everything else, is purely subjective. And what interest is, is the price of waiting, in essence. It's a pure, it's a time, it's a time preference story. Uh, to, for me to give up money today to get more later, right, that's the interest kind of story. So their usual story is about that the, the interest rates have sent the wrong signals. What, it, what people think at lower interest rates is, oh, it's a good idea for me to take on these very long, time-consuming processes because that's what people really want. And, well, they don't, actually, because the signal, they're getting the wrong information. So you end up, for example, a couple years ago with like 2 million houses that nobody wants to buy, even though the interest rates were really low. So from the producer side, or the supply side, they, they were getting a signal like, hey, I need, it's profitable for me to borrow now so to, for these pro to build things that people want in the future. And it turns out we were really horribly wrong on that one. Um, people didn't really want those houses. Um, fortunately, it just is an aside. I, I half jokingly said we should do what the Irish are doing with their excess houses. Has anyone seen the yeah, announced the plan? Or, the central bank or government is buying them and bulldozing them. Uh, I half joking. There's got to be some flaw in that model in my head. <laughs> um, but like you know, what? You know, we've got excess supply of housing. Just bulldoze it, right? <laughs> so I, I mean, I joked about it actually before, and then someone sent me the news report and said, "Well, Ireland's actually doing your, your nutty idea." I'm like, maybe I should go there. <laughs> But that's really the traditional explanation for it, is that it's largely a banking type story. I think nowadays people have sort of generalized, uh, are willing to accept other ex explanations that are out there. Um, you know, particularly about sometimes just random stuff happens, that's like real business cycle theory. That, you know, even like in 2008, for example, that's when we had a big oil shock in the United States in June or, or July and August of 2008. And if you remember, that's when gas prices got to like $4 a gallon. Uh, which happened to precede when really things got bad. But that's, I think that's a compliment um, to it. But it, it is starting to become a more active area of research. For a long time, I think people largely deferred, myself included, to what Hayek's basic story was um, about this interest rates, rather than thinking there could be other ways that prices are sending the wrong signals um, in other markets as well, whether it be the labor markets or too much labor is moving in one direction or something like that. You know, that's, my, that's really my concern with education, actually, is you guys as students aren't getting the right information about what the job market looks like. Because you, know, you, you beg and plead with like departments to say, well, how are you, what's the placement look like? And like, oh, 90% of our students got jobs within six months. And you sort of chuckle because, you know, waiter and waitress counts as a job. Mm -hmm. um, you want to ask them specifically, like in this field, what happened? And many departments are very unwilling to share that information. And the state of Virginia, if you don't know it, has posted the data now. Sample size is pretty small, but where majors from all the schools, the public universities in Virginia, it's public information now. You can see what their average income is and how they're doing, which you should probably check out if you're, you know, just get a better sense of what's going on out there. Because you know, it's like you know, various majors here. They'll tell you like your last semester of senior year, oh yeah, the job market, it's not so good, right? Uh, <laughs> but by then it's too late, unless you're willing to stay for another year. But I think we're going to, because we believe, like next week, we're going to do a little plug here. Uh, Tyler Cowan from George Mason is coming down Tuesday, I think at 4 o'clock, over, do you guys know where it is? Grafton Stovall, I think. Um, right, he's from Marginal Revolution, foreign policy, named him like one of the 100 most influential people in the world, or whatever it was. He's coming to talk about the Great Stagnation. So it's not, it's kind of like a business cycle story, but it's also about the slowdown in income growth in the United States that's been happening since about 1973 or so. It should be, and he's going to you know, offer what he thinks is the ultimately the sources of it. When is that again? Tuesday at four, I think. Can you, Laura? Can you send that to this group? No. Yeah, I think you're right that it's in Grafton. I think it is. He, you know, they're expecting a lot of people to come see him because you know I knew him before he was Tyler Cowan. Uh, I've known him since I was undergraduate, um, but now he's like all fancy and whatnot. Some uh, of us may have seen him because he did an opening speech at a Students for Liberty conference that we went to. I don't know. Marginal Revolution is a great blog. Yeah, it's, I like it because it, it's not just economics, so. Um, yeah, it's a lot of stuff. stuff. And his food interests and mine are pretty similar, so I like reading that kind of stuff. Um, with the not quite as crazy as his, but 
Um, I like that kind of thing. Other questions? Thank you very All much. Right.